So good morning for some of you and afternoon for the others. And thank you again for, for joining us today. And welcome to this webinar to launch the new edition of the minimum standard for the protection of children in humanitarian action. So this webinar is the second in a series of two webinar for the region. So the first one was yesterday that we held. And today we are pleased to hold this webinar in English for the English speaking countries of the, of the region. So we will certainly learn from the other countries about the contextualization effort on the adaptation of the CPMS in their respective area, but also how they are using the standard in this period of COVID-19. And we happily have um, some representatives from different countries. We have Cameroon, we have Niger, we have Nigeria, and they are working in different organizations and agencies, including Save the Children, Plan International, UNICEF, in addition to the um, regional colleague based in, in Dakar, Senegal. So I'm um, Adam Ajalo, the French help desk for the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. And for those who are not familiar with the CPR, our mission is with, um, we are in, in the global protection cluster and our mission is to support actors at the global, regional and local level to ensure that humanitarian effort to protect children are timely, well coordinated and achieve a maximum coverage. So we also, as you could hear, we have Joanna with us um, who is co-leading the CPIMS working group that will come and read this webinar and introduce us to the new edition. So um, before we go to the agenda and some management um, items, so I'll, I'll give the floor to Joanna for a introduction. Thank you, Adama. I should say that this webinar and the webinar series is uh, co-organized between the CPAOR and the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And it's been a great pleasure to work with Adama at the regional level to, to get these webinars underway. For those of you who don't know me, I am indeed the global co-chair um, of the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group. I'm a contribution by UNICEF to the Global Alliance. Um, if you don't know the Alliance, uh, it's perhaps that your organization that you work for is indeed a member. We have over 100 agencies around the world that are members of the Alliance. The Alliance's goal is to prevent and respond to the protection challenges of children in humanitarian settings around the world. We have four different pillars. Uh, we have standard setting, which is what the CPMS uh, is about. We have evidence generation. So assessment and measurement and so on. We have a working group on advocacy for child protection uh, in humanitarian action. And then we have uh, a pillar that looks at learning and development. So building the capacity of the workforce before a disaster hits or during uh, a humanitarian situation. So if you want to learn more about the Alliance, uh, I welcome you, I encourage you to head to our website and I'll be able to share some of the details of that at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Joanna. As for the, the agenda, so the first part, we will deal with the use of the standard in the region. So since 2012, when the first edition was launched, and also talk about the importance of the standard in the Western and Central, um, and Central region, a place, as you know, um, of several humanitarian contexts, IDPs, refugees, mixed situation. And then we follow up on the example of the context in Niger. Afterward, we will have the presentation from UNHCR colleague on the section on consideration on forcibly displaced population. And then the use of a standard in current context of COVID-19 from our colleague of the plan. And then finally, how they uh, integrated the standard in other programs like uh, shelters, health. And we will have also time for question and answer before, before closing. Thank you and over to you, Joanna. I have the great pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Many of you know Jan Grondin, uh, as he is the Regional Technical Advisor for Child Protection in Humanitarian Settings for UNICEF. He's been in the role for almost two years, but he comes to the role with over 15 years of experience in both development and humanitarian intervention in the fragile context in Africa, as well as in Asia. So welcome, Jan. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for the Alliance and the CPIOR for inviting me to, uh, to introduce that uh, webinar because I'm uh, really pleased. I, I was uh, myself in DRC when we uh, first uh, launched and started to implement the standard in 2012. So I'm uh, quite happy to be part of that uh, second uh, 
series. Uh, ju just a, a very quick uh, overview of the situation. Why, why, why does uh, those standards uh, matter for region? I mean, all of you know that uh, we, are, we, we are evolving in a very fragile context. Uh, the, the map on the left uh, with the blue countries uh, are the ones that are considered as facing a humanitarian situation. So we've got many, many countries also on the the coastal parts of Western and Central Africa that are now facing, have to face the COVID pandemic or who used to face other crises like uh, Ebola. So I think most of the countries are now classified as fragile uh, countries. We've, we've got a very young and vulnerable population. I was looking at some data the other day and I think the population under 18 has double uh, in the last uh, 25 years. And having uh, such a set of standards uh, that, that are dedicated to support those vulnerable children is really important for a region. We've got plurality of uh, humanitarian crisis. So what we have uh, kind of in dark blue on the map are the kind of a hot spot at the moment. Uh, they're evolving and quite often those crises are overlapping. So you've got countries like, uh, for example, Niger, where you've got the situation in Lac Chad, which is slowly impacting the, the situation in Central Sahel. We've got natural disaster, drought, uh, that are overlaps with political or man-made disaster, which means that those having a strong child protection network uh, with the same understanding on you know, the issues, the phase, the tools that are exa existing and the way to address those vulnerabilities is really important. Growing needs, I think we are around, I mean, we're still consolidating data because now with the COVID it has changed, but we, we are at about 50 million people in need of uh, humanitarian assistance of whom uh, half of them are children. When I look at the results achieved over the past three to four years in terms of, uh, you know, of uh, children associated with armed groups or children that are unaccompanied, children that have been supporting with uh, psychosocial support, there's a consistent increase of a number of children rich. We've got about, and I think uh, our colleague from uh, UNHCR will talk about it, but uh, we've got about 10 million displaced people in including IDPs and refugees, of whom almost half are children. We've got a very wide variety of actors, going from community organization, uh, local NGOs, INGOs, UN organization, and at the time, and we'll see that uh, with the new standard, at the time where access is becoming the, the main challenge for all of us. This is really important to acknowledge and the role of uh, local actors, uh, but also to make sure that we all have the, again, the same understanding and the same capacity. And the standards is really, the aim is really to provide a common knowledge among all of us. And finally, limited financial uh, mobilization capacities of the sector, uh, depending on the country, on the year we are between 25 to 55% of our funding requirements that are met every year. Also, talking the same language is also helping us to better advocate for the sector and for the for our response. So the 2012 edi edition was very, very popular, as you all know. We think there are more than 70,000 users in more than 50 countries. It was translated in many, many different language, 14 translation, uh, of course, including uh, French. Uh, 18 countries have uh, contextualized them, and a third of them were in uh, Western and Central Africa. One of the examples of how important contextualization is to those standards, we had the discussion the other day about Guinea, you know, responding to the Ebola crisis, and which, you know, passed the message that the standards, the 2012 standards, were not really adapted to this kind of a situation or needed further alignment that uh, has helped uh, the Alliance to take this uh, issue on board and, and to develop uh, their guidance for how to address child protection issues in disease and pandemic humanitarian crisis. And this is now the one that we are using to respond to COVID. So, you know, part of the knowledge was also, or part of the reflection was coming from uh, Western and Central Africa, 
went back to the Alliance. And I mean, Alliance, as uh, Jonah was saying, is all of us. And now is uh, used for the, the COVID uh, response. And it's also a very highly demanded guidelines through the online HSP uh, application. And I'm sure Adama can put the link if you want to download the application on your on your telephone, on your computer. However, sorry, uh, some gaps, um, some core principles uh, were sidelined, which means that sometimes the, there was a disconnection between the norm and standards and the core principle of uh, of child protection. And I think the work that uh, that was done by the task force was to see how this could be better reflected, mainstream throughout uh, the document. There was um, some questioning about indicators, the way uh, the tools for measurement, how it could be used. To be honest, the 2012 edition has really shifted the child protection in emergency way of monitoring data uh, because even though st sometimes the the proposed indicators uh, were not that adapted it has opened the discussion uh, in a, in many many countries about you know are we talking about the same thing what are we tracking uh, how do we consolidate data or can we use that for advocacy or can we use that uh, you know for funding mobilization so they, they've been further in the reflection, but that was already a, a good added value from the first uh, edition. More emphasis on the, the, the role of uh, local and local actors. And uh, as I was saying previously, uh, given the challenges we all face in terms of access, local actors are playing a significant role, but they need to be supported and they need to be also part of the, the discussion and the reflection. And I think the CPAOR and the Alliance uh, to some extension has also done a very good job in bringing those color organization around the table of discussion to bring their own knowledge, their own understanding, and uh, we, we, we will see some examples after that. The role of, uh, I mean, the question of accountability, accountability to affected uh, population, uh, inclusion, of course. One of the kind of a missing uh, parts from the first edition was definitely the prevention part, and that much better addressed in the, in the new one. And the question of uh, integration and collaboration across sectors. As I was saying in the beginning uh, in 2012, I was myself in a DRC working with uh, INGOs and we were working on uh, protection and child protection mainstreaming. The first edition was very helpful in kind of a you know, opening the discussion, bringing the different sectors to discuss what we're doing relates to their work and things like that. I think there's been a huge shift uh, over the past few years and the new version is kind of giving you new tools and, uh, and make the references uh, easier. New effective intervention, cash and voucher assistance. Regarding the cash assistance, this is definitely global shift, and this is definitely where our region is sometimes far behind uh, other region uh, because of uh, the nature of the crisis, but also because of the investment we've made. With a regional perspective, I can tell you that we've got many, many big partners, big donors that are coming and saying, you know, what we want to support cash, but how do we do cash transfer related to child protection and, and things like that? Also the the question of gender, which is a much better incorporate uh, and, and environmental uh, concerns, uh, we can, I mean, that's going to be the, the fuel of, of most of the crisis in the coming uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And we can see that in the Sahelian uh, countries, that is, uh, you know, the, the economic burden, the pressure on uh, natural resources is really kind of a, one of the main reasons. For example, some of you have made, uh, made have read that uh, you and you study on, on children associated uh, with armed groups and one of the country was Mali and you know and and trying to understand why children did join uh, armed groups and one of the main reason was you know that there, there was no uh, no opportunities uh, too many people uh, not access to land um, so definitely uh, uh, an important uh, point and of course, mobile uh, programming. How do we address in our region where we've got so many forced displaced children, refugees, but also children that are generally on the move, which is the majority? How do we adapt our uh, program 
programming to respond to their needs. So I said that the, one of the gap uh, was to be, be applicable to a wider range of contexts, including uh, children and, uh, and families who are refugee, displaced, and uh, we, we just talked about that, the infectious uh, disease. Urban areas, it might not be the main focus for our humanitarian response for the moment. In general, you know, we, we, we've got more from what I can see across the, the region, the humanitarian response is often not, not in a your, your urban areas, while uh, we see with the COVID that the main issues are in a, in big cities. So definitely a good added uh, value. Also all the, the question of uh, dangers and uh, opportunities of uh, internet. Uh, and I think that's, what, that's very relevant with the COVID pandemic. I think that's it. Just to say that uh, the, the review of the standard uh, involved various countries, many countries and, uh, and different uh, experts. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Jan, and thank you for putting the first edition, the 2012 edition, into the context um, of, of West Africa, drawing from different experiences, in, including your own in, in DRC. I wanted to now introduce some colleagues coming from Niger. We have uh, Mireille Palaris, who's a specialist in child protection and emergencies with UNICEF. She's been working on the African continent for the last 10 years or so, first on the issue of disarmament, demobilization, repatriation, reintegration, and resettlement. She will be joined afterwards by Emmanuel Hogg, who is the Child Protection Working Group Coordinator in Niger, and they're going to talk about the contextualization of the CPMS in that country. Over to you, Mireille. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous. So I'm uh, working now in Niger. Uh, we may have a few issues with connection, uh, so uh, hopefully it's, gonna be, it's going to be fine. So I will uh, introduce and contextualize a bit the situation in Niger and give an example of the CPMS contextualization that was done in 2018. So I'm a UNICEF specialist, so I'm not the coordinator, but in 2018 I was there for the entire process, so this is why I'm presenting and after Emmanuel will be uh, also joining us for the perspectives. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, the situation in Niger, as Jan was mentioning a bit before. Niger is affected in fact by a, a few conflicts, uh, as you can see on the map. We have the Lake Chad Basin conflict, uh, which started uh, in 2015 in Niger with the non-state armed group Boko Haram who reached Niger. Uh, we have also the Sahel region that is being affected. Uh, as you can see in red, Tilaberi Tawa, uh, with borders with Burkina Faso, as well as with Mali, uh, which uh, started uh, around 2017 and has increased. And the situation has been uh, deteriorating in the last uh, year. And another situation that uh, we are facing right now is the movement of over 30,000 refugees coming from Nigeria to Mahadi a region due to exactions done by a non-state armed group in uh, mostly in Nigeria but also situation is starting in Mahadi with population movement so as you can understand these uh, uh, are affecting all child protection uh, situation we have IDPs refugees returnees and children on the move as also Niger is a transit country for uh, children and adults uh, crossing reaching Libya or also going up to Algeria the issues that we are facing are mostly the situation of unaccompanied children and separated children children associated to uh, armed groups also uh, psychosocial issues issues, mental health, uh, the used exploitation, the trafficking of children, and the uh, unfortunately high uh, level of uh, child marriage. I think over 74 to 76 percent of children of girls are married under the age of 18. So we have a, a cluster dynamics, so there is the child protection subcluster at the NIAMI level led by UNICEF, co-led by the Ministry of uh, women's promotion and child protection, as well as technical working group in the region of, uh, of DIFA and uh, Tilaberi. So I wanted to get back to you on the contextualization process of the CPMS and go through the steps. So the exercise was done in 2018, but discussion started already in 2016. And in 2017, the members of the subcluster benefited from a training on CPMS which led in fact to uh, the possibility to do the contextualization of the CPMS in Niger with funding coming from um, 
Terre des Hommes, Lausanne, and the consultancy uh, done by Save the Children. So the process took around three, three months, and then the launch of the contextualization document was done in October uh, of that same year. So it took a bit, a bit of time, so we have to count at least uh, six months to be able to go through this contextualization. So the objectives, in fact, were to adapt, of course, the standards to the actual context uh, with the idea of supporting actors in their work and mostly national NGOs and state actors. We wanted also not to focus only on national and work at the national level, but really to involve the regions in conflict through the working groups and their analysis uh, of the context and analysis of the situation, knowing that uh, the situation is always evolving or deteriorating, unfortunately. Through also the uh, localization strategy, there was really um, an eagerness of the subcluster and uh, partners um, to involve not more national NGOs and uh, also state actors knowing that Niger uh, was uh, mostly having structural issues, suddenly we were coming into emergency. So national NGOs had to be trained for emergency work, but as well understand really the standards and, to, and contextualize them to, to Niger. And of course, one of the objectives was to create a multi-sectorial dynamics. So we had also in uh, the process education cluster members, uh, GBV sub clusters as well, I think as administration as well, and WASH at some point. So the, the, the steps that we used to reach the finalization, validation of the contextualization of the CPMS was first to set up the working groups in the regions. And then each region um, were also selecting standards that we, were, we would work on as the standards that, uh, or the issues that were most seen in the country. So you can see the, the six standards that were contextualized. There was no time availabilities also to contextualize all standards. So the first work was done in Niamey and work on the draft among the actors and then the drafts were sent to the regional working groups where inputs were done and then the validation work, uh, workshop was done at the, at the national level. We had a few uh, very positive results of this process in itself, is over 110 members of child protection subclusters and ministries were involved. So we had also the involvement of the ministries of child protection, humanitarian action and justice as well as, as defense. So that was really good to have the views of all uh, those actors. There was an official launch and a sponsorship of this contextualization by the Prime Minister of Niger. So that was done. That's why it took a bit longer for the process because the launching was done in October. But we, but we had finished in June uh, to work on the, on the contextualization document. So hard copies, of course, were shared to the regional directorates for child protection in the various regions. And as well, a PDF document uh, was made uh, accessible to all actors uh, to um, really work on it and use them during their programming. We also had, and that was very interesting, a young artist who was also going through uh, the technical groups to draw each standard with the association of the children and youth workers of Niger, Niger, I guess, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so they were um, really involved also in the process. So that was really interesting for us. The discussions we had, the understanding of the standards by a younger population there. So we had, uh, of course, a few benefits, as I was mentioning, a real inclusive and particip participative process to reach the, uh, the, the final document, strong involvement by state actors, so what was also needed, and one of the objectives was really to, to have this national ownership, not to expect the, just the NGOs of using it, but also for the various actors and protection services to own this document. As well, as I was mentioning, this important integration of the national NGOs and uh, the integration of the standards in the program. So I wanted to give you just a few examples. We worked, for example, on the various standards there on, the, for example, sexual violence, while we were working on the, on the contextualization, we also had in parallel the um, involvement of the child and adolescent survivor initiative uh, consultants. So that was really interesting to have a double process and we could 
uh, involve discussions, ensure that uh, indicators were uh, put in the contextualization and ensure that the quality of intervention uh, were uh, in fact added in the contextualization document. So we were really lucky to have this uh, CASI um, work to be done at the same time. Then also for the CAFAG, for the Standard 11, we had already a strategy uh, in DIFA of how to work with the various services, but then we did not have that uh, dialogue done in the Tila Berhitawa region as it was quite a new um, conflict going on. So we had very important dialogue with the justice and the police actors, a judge for minors, brigade pour mineurs, etc., to set up this strategy uh, of transferring a child from uh, anti-terrorist appeal or detention up to um, uh, full reunification, reinsertion. So we had very good discussions and also interesting of discussions on the CAFAG. So children being involved in the armed forces, which brought uh, a good day of discussions. In fact, do, should we involve that FA uh, in, uh, um, in, the, in the contextualization? Then with the standard 15, uh, we um, also had the chance to work on the setup of the CPIMS, which is a child protection information ma management system. And with the consultant that has been with us since 2018 to set it up. And in fact, this consultant is using this contextualization document as a starting point to review and adapt the procedures on case management. So it's being used almost as a legal guideline document because it was validated by the government and by the primature. So this is also a very good use of this contextualization document. And uh, standard 16, we had uh, also organizations really working at uh, community levels uh, to make sure that the standards and the indicators and the results were being shared uh, with community leaders, child protection, volunteers, etc. Well, as you know, with any activities, you, have, uh, you do have a few challenges. So I was mentioning with the benefits, we had a lot of organizations or individuals from the subcluster being in the process. However, there was not really or a lack, not no, but a lack of ownership of the standards by the NGOs. Uh, rather than the individuals. Uh, so, of course, with the situation in Niger and the deterioration and the movement of funding in different regions, there was a lot of turnovers, maybe a lack of returns to colleagues and referrals of the, the contextualization in the planning. Also, there is a need of reinforcing the, the accompaniment of the use of the tool and uh, also try to focus as well on the analysis of the impacts of the contextualization on the planning and the programs. Uh, as we had uh, state actors being involved in the process, at the beginning we could notice that a few of these actors were not familiar with the uh, CPMS standards. So that was a bit of a challenge at the beginning because the idea was more for them to change or just remove a sentence, uh, change a comma, etc. But uh, the accompaniment of the subcluster members and coordinators allowed uh, the state actors to really understand what the process was and what the standards that were contextualized were. Also, one of the challenge, I mean, that this is also current in different countries, is the various contexts in Niger is not necessarily allowing an easy outreach of the standards. Being DIFA is not totally the same as Tilaberi, especially for the strategy for the reinsertion of uh, CAFAG. In Tilaberi, it's uh, uh, more challenging, while in DIFA, it was well strategized by all local actors. And unfortunately, well, there's a weak resource mobilization by child protection actors in order to use the standards and the contextualization and to apply it in the programming. So this is challenges that can be for any way uh, used positively. So my three main or the three main recommendations also of the members, it's really to reinforce the capacities of the actors in the use of the standards. The contextualization um, should be really a referral tool and use of the indicators to write projects, really to refer to, uh, to this tool, to of course continue the outreach and reinforcement of the follow-up and coordination of the response. And in fact, with the new standards coming up in 2019, it would be interesting to revise the actual contextualization in order to, to adapt it to uh, the next future. 
So thank you. That's for my part. I will leave Emmanuel, the coordinator of the subcluster, to present you the perspectives of the subcluster. Hi. So I'm Emmanuel, uh, Child Protection Subcluster Coordinator. So now for the next step, we will try to create a deeper understanding and use of the CPMS in Niger at regional level, but also among various layers of the child protection sector. It means that uh, the communication strategy uh, will share knowledge uh, with the ministry, the NGO and the UN actors, but also with the community volunteers and the beneficiaries. We will present the CPMS to them as uh, child protection services, and uh, we hope that uh, it will create a deeper uh, use of uh, the child protection services. To do the, so, we, we are happy to be able to use uh, the material uh, developed by Plan International, uh, especially podcast translated in local languages, and um, we think that it will help us to reach uh, community volunteers and beneficiaries at a regional level and uh, en enable um, a deeper uh, assimilation of uh, the child protection uh, minimum standard. And uh, of course, this work will uh, complement, complement uh, what was done uh, previously and uh, explained by Muriel. Great, thank you both uh, to Muriel and uh, Emmanuel. I'm going to keep moving forward in the interest of time. Uh, and I wanted to now introduce you to the 2019 edition. We've heard from Jan and the others about what was in the original document, and I wanted to take you through the revision. So to do that, I'm going to launch a little poll. You should now be able to see two questions. The first one is, have you read some of the 2019 edition yet? It was launched in English seven months ago, back in October. And then the second question is, which of the standards do you use the most? So I wasn't able to list all 26 of the 2012 or the 2019 has 28 standards, but I listed um, many under pillar two and pillar three. And we're starting to get your answers coming in. I'm going to introduce you to the 2019 edition. So for those of you who've picked it up or looked at it online, it is the same wonderful handbook. It is a little bit longer with those 28 standards and thus a little bit heavier, but it's the same strength of document that you've come to know and love. As Jan mentioned, there are many people involved in uh, the revision. Over 1,100 people input it, um, either online or through the expert revision groups or through the consultation process. We had about 300 children and parents contribute their thoughts to one or more of the standards. And 85 agencies, child protection agencies, humanitarian agencies, uh, child protection and humanitarian setting uh, organizations were involved in the re revision process. So certainly this edition wasn't possible without that high level of effort and commitment um, to use the document. So if your agency, if the agency you work for is a member of the Alliance, then it has endorsed the Child Protection Minimum Standards. And indeed all staff are expected to use it as a central guidance tool. So we have the wonderful reality of, of building on the 2012 edition. It has the same great design. The color coding is the same. There are tabs, so you find things. There is a spiral binding to the hard copy to open it up. But we have in particular added icons, you know, visual clues so that we see cross-cutting issues, so that we make connections between different issues, between different standards with particular, you know, uh, things that are important. But overall, the design is the same. And we really want you, if you've used the 2012, to open the 2019 edition and feel comfortable and know how to navigate your way around the document. So before we come to those icons, let's see, about 60% of you have already read some of it. So I encourage the rest of you to go online, uh, download the app and have a look at uh, the 2019 edition. Sexual and gender-based violence is the most commonly used uh, standard along with case management. Obviously there's a link between those. After that comes unaccompanied and separated children amongst you responding and then community level approaches. So that's, that's an interesting uh, mix. Towards the bottom, uh, for this group at least, uh, dangers and injuries, 
uh, CAFAG, and so on. I can share the results, so that's good for you to see as well. We will see here some of the icons that we've been using in the 20, 2018 edition. So I'm going to put up one of the icons, and I want you in the chat box to guess what you think it is. Displacement, says Lisa. Okay, absolutely. This icon, we can go to the next one. This icon is displacement of populations. Then we have one at the bottom of the screen. What do you think this icon is? Do we have anyone willing to take a guess? Case management, says Yvette. Absolutely right. That's our icon for case management. What do you think the one on the left is? Unaccompanied children, says Jennifer. Okay, Dama, how about you show the other, the next one, and then maybe people can guess what that one is. So we had the one on the left has the figure on the left dark, and the one on the right that Adam has just put up is the figure on the right is dark. So Domenico says the one on the left is young children, and then perhaps the one on the right is adolescents. Do people agree? Yvette says a child, adolescents, yeah, absolutely. So the icon on the left is the one that we're using to point to young children, so zero to eight, and then uh, the adolescents are the 19 to 17 year olds, uh, the one on the right. If I could have the next one, in the top right, you're going to see an icon. I bet a lot of you know this one. The coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Any others? Agnes says the same thing. The pandemic, says Yvette. Absolutely right. When we were revising this and coming up, revising the 2012 edition and coming up with the icons, we obviously couldn't foresee COVID-19. But we did know that infectious disease outbreaks, as Jan have said, and pandemics are an increasing issue and, and we'd identified that they weren't well reflected in the CPMS, partly because of um, the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa teaching us that lesson. So we wanted to make sure that it was a cross-cutting theme. And so now for the COVID-19 response, if you flick through the document, the, the 2019 edition, you will see this icon throughout. And those are your go-to places in a particular standard or in the introduction, et cetera, where you will see that there are particular issues, particular sensitivities or challenges that we need to think through if we're working in an infectious disease outbreak. What do people think this one is? A magnifying glass with an arrow. Indicator, says Yvette. Absolutely right. So this is our measurement or indicator, meal, says Domenico. Perfect. Now we have uh, the second to last icon, which is the hand with the figure inside it. Fairly common icon. Safeguarding, says Peggy and Wagab. Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely right. Safeguarding of children. And then the last icon is a little bit more tricky. And this is when we kind of have to teach ourselves when we start to use a 2019 edition. But let's see if you can guess, or maybe you've already had a look. So we have safety and security, prevention of risk, says Yvette. Older adolescents, maybe. Any last guesses? Protective environment. Wonderful. So the icon here that uh, the, 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 the message or the, the topic that we're trying to get across is indeed prevention. If we go to the next slide, we'll see a whole list of them. And we're wanting to, uh, with that shield, look at the prevention of child protection risks. And as Jan said, that wasn't really as clear in the 2012 edition. And we wanted to make sure we weren't only focusing on preparedness and response, but actual prevention of these child protection risks that we know that children can face in a humanitarian setting. So really, we challenge you to look out for the icons as you review the 2019 edition. In particular, that infectious disease one might be very um, useful at the moment and to think about what these mean for your way of working uh, on any particular area, whether you're looking at case management, sexual violence, and, and uh, CAFAG, for example. Well, what does it mean if they're adolescents or if it's or younger children? What do, we, what do we mean when we're talking about prevention, when we, when we look and unpack these standards, et cetera? All right, so now let us have a little look on the next slide about the content. This was the breakdown of the 2012 edition. And now with the next click, you will see the 2019 edition, that we still have the four pillars. We now have 28 standards, but cut across the same four pillars. And then as Jan mentioned, we really wanted to make sure that the, uh, the 10 principles were um, embedded in our work, that people were aware of those principles as we go about um, uh, working to, to protect children from exploitation, violence, uh, abuse, and so on. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see those 10 principles. I would quiz you about what they are, but you can see them on the left, and I'm sure most of you are very knowledgeable about, uh, about them. As you know, the four core ones come from the Convention on the Rights of the Child, then we have four that come through SPHERE's protection principles, and then two that are specific to uh, the Child Protection Minimum Standards. These haven't changed. We wanted to make sure that people understood that they're all equal. There's no number one, number five, and so on, but really 
that these are all how we as child protection workers approach our work in a principled way. And then under each standard, you will see any particular one. So for case management, for example, you might see best interests of the child particularly highlighted. It doesn't mean that it's more important. It doesn't mean that it has more value than any other principle, but there might be particular considerations that you, you want to be, be thinking about. You'll see that um, once again, there is an introduction in the document to child protection in humanitarian action. It gives um, you know, an understanding of what it is, its international legal basis. It talks about minimum standards. Who are they for? How are they developed? How do we use them for designing projects, evaluating work, etc.? Um, it talks about the connections to other standards. So um, we you know, have built on what Sphere is doing. We connect with INEE and MERS and so on. So um, it shows how we are integrated through the Humanitarian Standards Partnership with all humanitarian quality and accountability measures. And then it talks of the cross-cutting issues that uh, we've, we've highlighted already in the presentation. So I find this introduction a really excellent overview for new staff who are coming on or for development colleagues who don't know so much about the humanitarian context. We'll move on to pillar one. There's not a huge amount of change in this pillar, but I will highlight um, standard one. Uh, the Global Child Protection AOR and UNHCR jointly drafted this standard because as we said, we wanted to pull out the refugee context more in the 2019 edition of the CPMS. So it clearly explains what to expect and how to get involved in coordination structures in these two different contexts where there is a cluster system activated and where it's a refugee coordination model. And then the other piece that I really wanted to highlight was that hand with the child in it, that icon, saying that throughout, I mean, in this pillar, particularly under standard two, but throughout the whole document, there is a stronger emphasis on child safeguarding and the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse of any of the people that we work with. So moving on to pillar two, before getting into the actual uh, standards, which we know and love and, and work on so hard, uh, we just developed this diagram to remind us about the interconnected nature of the standards, particularly in pillar two. We know that it's one child that we're working with. It's one family's life that we're entering and have the privilege of trying to assist. So um, if there are mental health and psychosocial distress issues, then maybe it's because of um, some issues with the parents around sexual and gender-based violence, or maybe it's because the child um, is unaccompanied, or maybe the same child is also facing physical and emotional maltreatment in the family or in the school setting or so on. So we wanted to make sure that we're really thinking in an interconnected way. Going on to the next slide, we don't really have time to go into the content of each standards, but I'm going to highlight two. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we do have a poll about what further support would you like. So if, for example, you'd like webinars on a particular standard, that's a chance to, to say so uh, or to put into the chat box that, you know, you have a very interesting program on child labor and you would like to unpack it with others in the region using the 2019 edition of the CPMS. And maybe we can help put together such a webinar over the coming months. Um, so in standard 18, this standard expanded the focus. Um, the first focus, the focus in the 2012 edition was really physical violence. Um, and this one builds on new guidance and research from the Inspire Handbook, which is threaded throughout um, the, the 2019 edition, uh, World Health Organization, as well as the Alliance's own research uh, on child neglect in humanitarian settings. And it, it emphasizes both the short-term and long-term negative impacts on children of physical and emotional uh, maltreatment and tries to provide some guidance and, and, and coordination about how we can respond, better respond to these uh, two challenges that children and families face. Uh, and then the second one on standard nine really um, gives a broader focus on gender-based violence uh, while recognizing children, both girls and boys, uh, face particular risks and needs related to sexual violence. So, you know, it, it, it acknowledges um, that gender inequality is a root cause of, of this form of violence. Um, it looks at how, how and when is it possible to change social and gender norms in a humanitarian context. And also really along with our colleagues, um, in the gender-based violence community strengthens the survivor-centered approach to our response. So I want to move on to pillar three. As you can tell, we're doing a very quick overview for all of this. Um, and pillar three looks at adapting, uh, sorry, developing adequate systems. 
Um, I don't know how much people are using now the socio-ecological model. I know that there's been a lot of work in West Africa and Central Africa on the child protection systems. Um, and this pillar goes a step beyond that to also think about the socio-ecological model. It links in again um, with the Global Inspire initiative. And it would be wonderful if we could come back at some time in the region and unpack kind of the socio-ecological model in, in, a, in a separate webinar. But on the next slide, we'll see that there's a couple of uh, differences in this pillar to, to what we had before. So there's a new standard on strengthening family and caregiving environments. And we thought this was uh, very important. So, uh, for example, in the infectious disease outbreaks, outbreak setting, um, you know, how do we look at uh, ensuring that there's healthy communication between family members? How do we look at supporting family members who are ill uh, and while they self-isolate or indeed while they may have to be hospitalized? So issues like that. We separated out alternative care from unaccompanied and separated children. So there's a particular focus uh, on that issue. And then much more, you know, heavy revision to standard 15, which used to just be child-friendly spaces, but now we're looking at a multiple uh, approaches to working with children in groups. A rethink uh, working with communities and making sure that as far as possible, we're working at things being community-led. And then standard 20, justice for children be a more, being a more overarching protective strategy and not just children who are detained uh, and, and so on but looking at uh, different ways that the justice system supports children or at times challenges their, their rights. Um, okay, finally we'll go to pillar four and we've already talked about this a little bit uh, and we're gonna have some examples given to us momentarily. But uh, in pillar four, we're really looking at moving beyond mainstreaming, which was the main focus in uh, the 2012 edition, to acknowledge that there are other ways of working, such as joint programming with our colleagues in nutrition or education, or indeed integrated programming uh, with colleagues in other sectors. And by doing so, this pillar and, and the introduction, which I would really encourage you, as well as you know, sharing it with colleagues who are outside of child protection to read, it really recognizes the centrality of protection across all humanitarian efforts. And it highlights how we can, if we're blind to children's needs, if we're blind to children's capacities as well, then we can really have a negative impact uh, on, their, on their protection. And so it, it uh, challenges us to rethink working together and, and the impacts that we're having. And on the next slide, we actually look at a few of the standards. So there, there are new standards on food security and on livelihoods. Um, distribution of non-food items as well as food items is integrated, integrated across the standards, so particular challenges that we know that children um, and families may face uh, it will be found under the different standards. And then as I've said, there's, uh, there's key actions for ourselves as child protection actors, uh, key actions for our WASH colleagues or our shelter colleagues, etc. But then there's a section that looks at how we work together and key actions that we, we both should be or all should be undertaking. And then just going to the last slide or second to last slide probably, just looking at the annexes. So the annexes in the handbook themselves are relatively unchanged. There's a small glossary and so on. But if you go online to the Alliance website, you will find an extensive glossary. And I will bet you that there's at least one term that you don't know uh, that's in that glossary, maybe a handful, maybe more. So it's, it's very useful um, uh, if you're new or even if you're quite a seasoned professional. And also it's useful for development colleagues and, and colleagues in other sectors. Um, there is a resource list and we will be updating it. It's by standard. We will be updating it every six months or so. And then a major addition is the table of indicators. And Jan had spoken to how um, there was a push to improve uh, our measurement. Under each standard in the handbook, you will find one, two, or three indicators. But on the annex, you will find many more indicators that you as an agency or as a subcluster may want to adopt in order to measure the progress of the work that you're doing. And then finally, I just wanted to leave you with some resources. On the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, you'll find the online interactive handbook. You'll find the app to put onto your phone, as well as a downloadable PDF if it's useful to you to print off some or to share it as a PDF. On the Alliance website, you'll find those three things or links to those three things, but also a summary, because we know that the whole document is very heavy, it's very large, it can be off-putting. So for people who are new to this, people who are outside of child protection, it may be more useful to send them the summary or to print off the summary locally. So we encourage you to think of that as a starting point, as a jumping off point for discussion. 
And then this presentation that, uh, that I've given um, is there. We call it the briefing pack, the What's New briefing pack. And there's also a two pager if you want to print that or send that around, giving some of the highlights of the 2019 edition. So I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to pass the, there'll be time for questions at the end, we hope, but I'm going to pass the floor now onwards to uh, our colleague at UNHCR. Um, Cliff Speck is joining us from uh, Geneva, where he works uh, as a child protection officer at the headquarters level. His main thematic area of focus uh, on that team is unaccompanied and separated children and alternative care as well as child-friendly procedures, particularly in asylum procedures, best interest procedures, so he works on, on case management, and children with disabilities, so quite a full plate. Um, he provides emergency response support to UNHCR field operations through deployments to the field, as well as was part of the small team at UNHCR that contributed to the revision of the CPMS. So he's really well placed to join us and talk to uh, the refugee and displacement uh, component of the minimum standards. Welcome Cliff. Thank you Joanna. This is Cliff. Uh, thanks. Uh, so as Joanna was saying, uh, we worked on uh, on uh, revision of uh, minimum standards. UNHCR was an active partner in this process and uh, a few areas where this was particularly important was already highlighted. Um, so that's uh, a key action on the part of UNHCR in relation to the minimum standards. Now, when it comes to uh, con uh, the field level contextualization and uh, operationalization, of course, there's quite a bit of work to do. And uh, this uh, is also specifically uh, the case in uh, Western and Central African region. So for the moment, uh, what's happening is uh, colleagues in the field have uh, been already looking at uh, how and what components of the CPMS uh, needs to be contextualized, especially in the case of uh, refugee children as well as children on the move. Uh, and uh, quite a bit of consultations have uh, already taken place at the refugee camp level. Um, so in, uh, in relation to specific challenges, however, uh, coordination remains an area that needs a bit of more uh, work on case management and best interest procedure, uh, which is I'm, uh, I'm a focal point for, and uh, information management. Uh, in these three components, uh, one uh, to be highlighted is uh, uh, in refugee situations, uh, we use the refugee coordination model, uh, which then uh, is something that colleagues in the field are very much familiar with and uh, working with, ensuring that uh, the minimum standards, the key components uh, relating to uh, coordination are also integrated is a task that we need to work towards. Uh, uh, case management and best interest procedure, of course, as I said, uh, in refugee context, uh, case management has its uh, peculiarities, uh, and hence UNHCR uses the term best interest procedure to reflect on uh, case management uh, for refugee children, uh, which also includes uh, special attention to and access to asylum procedures and, uh, and so on. So the alignment in that regard is a, is a, is a work to be done. Um, and uh, interesting to know at the global level, we are at the moment uh, finalizing the, uh, the new version of the best interest procedure guidelines, which takes a lot from the minimum standards, aligning it as the minimum standards, but also the interagency case management uh, guidelines. Information management remains another challenge, of course, uh, because uh, uh, in refugee settings, uh, UNHCR uses uh, progress uh, as a case management, uh, uh, information management system. This then uh, means interoperability with uh, other systems, uh, which is a, a work in progress at the moment. So uh, in, in terms of uh, the CPMS at the, as, we, as it is, already uh, protection of girls, boys, adolescents, uh, children uh, with different sexual orientation are all highlighted and uh, integrated. Uh, and uh, it also includes uh, specific uh, elements for families and family protection and so on, uh, which is very important actually in a refugee context uh, also because of the uh, specific nature of protection risk for uh, refugee children, especially when it comes to accessing services, accessing uh, national systems, which may operate differently for refugee children when compared to uh, children, uh, national children. However, as I mentioned before as well, there are lots of complementarities and uh, in fact uh, alignment with UNHCR guidelines around best in the procedure, which we'll be finalizing. The access to asylum is very much uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, access to services without discrimination is, uh, uh, is stated. And uh, it's something that we also will use uh, moving forward uh, in our 
our advocacy messages with the with the national authorities, especially where the 1951 convention has not been signed on to, or the states have uh, made reservations to specific articles of the convention. Non-discrimination uh, and non-detention of refugee children and asylum-seeking children are also quite vital. Cash assistance is another point that was mentioned earlier, and this is something that UNHCR is also working on, and uh, will look to the minimum standards uh, where uh, these are described. So uh, just to point out in COVID situation, uh, especially in West Africa, generally, of course, access to services are being limited uh, because of restricted movement, uh, stay in place orders. Uh, this is particularly challenging for refugee children, especially when uh, there are no, uh, they're not uh, registered or documented. Uh, family separation remains another key challenge, especially coming to light uh, during COVID. If you consider children who may have crossed the border prior to their parents are not able to uh, reunify with their families or vice versa. Refugees live in very uh, crowded environments, in uh, urban settings, uh, which also pose a specific risk. And like, uh, uh, like other children as well, may be called upon to go out and find work or to forage or to, to beg. And uh, this creates a uh, risk of exploitation and children being pulled into trafficking and smuggling uh, situations. Within the homes, uh, just like any other children, uh, refugee children too face risks of corporate punishment and violence and abuse as well. In relation to what we can do uh, and how we can uh, build upon uh, and work with the minimum standards, I think there are key standards to uh, aspire to and uh, try to achieve. Uh, this includes the work that needs to be done around family separation, uh, which I said uh, earlier was a specific challenge. Community-based uh, child protection is another area where uh, UNHCR uh, has a very uh, long-standing experience on, uh, but also ensuring that the standards that are relating to community engagement uh, is also developing uh, contingency plans uh, for future emergencies, uh, especially in this kind of situation is another element I think uh, we need to aspire for. And uh, establishing a remote case management, especially best interest procedure, is another area that we uh, feel that much more needs to be done. At the global level, UNHCI is working closely with the case management task force of the Child Protection Alliance on this area and working on a guidance note on this and also exploring webinars and uh, regional webinars on how to do this. Uh, in fact, there are quite a lot of interesting practices and uh, this is something we are going to be using. In terms of areas, uh, certainly uh, access to education needs to be strengthened and uh, we are working with colleagues on this. Different ways of uh, education, uh, especially distance learning. Of course, uh, an European model of uh, internet-based uh, learning may not be uh, feasible, certainly not be able to be implemented in many uh, operations where we find refugees, but uh, certainly options such as radio-based uh, learning can be explored and something that uh, the team in uh, West Africa is uh, brainstorming. And, and uh, community participation, I mentioned it before as well, or uh, recreational activities in uh, small groups is something to work towards, finding an uh, alternative message for adolescents and young people to contribute and participate also being explored and uh, being informed by the minimum standards. Access to information, again, another key challenge in uh, refugee settings. While uh, young people may have access to uh, online access. Uh, this may not be the case for persons with disabilities, children with disabilities, and so on. Then uh, relating to working with other sectors is, a, is also an important area, especially when uh, these sectors, in, even in refugee operations, have been working in silos, integrating and uh, ensuring that uh, each sector are familiar with the minimum standard as they apply to them, uh, wash, uh, health, uh, and so on. It's uh, something that needs to be done with regard to uh, contextualization of the minimum standards. Uh, so that's it uh, from our side. We continue to explore the opportunity to work with everyone uh, in the national level and the field level. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cliff. I think there's a, a lot to unpack in terms of how the CPMS can be implemented in refugee stateless settings or working with those populations. And I think you've highlighted some of the areas where there is much stronger alignment and a few areas where there still needs to be some discussion. And I'm sure there'll be that discussion at headquarters level as well as in the region as, as we move forward. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to move to our next speaker. Uh, this is Lisa Nanbam Daspan. She works with PLAN uh, in their Lake Chad program. Uh, she's a child protection and gender-based violence officer in Demboa in Borno State in Northeast Nigeria. And she's going to be talking about how they've taken on rolling out the 2019 edition of the CPMS. Lisa, welcome. Thank you, Joanna, for having me. I'm Lisa, gender-based violence and child protection officer working in Borno State, Northeast Nigeria. So I tested standard one 
on coordination through community dialogue sessions. Standard 10, mental health and psychosocial distress through awareness raising sessions. And standard 14 on child friendly spaces uh, through sensitization activities. The activities took place with one group of adult men aged 25 to 53, one group of girls aged 10 to 14, and with two groups of boys aged uh, 10 to 14 and 15 to 17. So I decided to engage with a group of adult men as they are the leaders in their communities. We engage constantly with community stakeholders and leaders to strengthen the community level child protection system. I tested the package in two locations of project implementation, Locust Camp in Dambua and Teachers Village Camp in Medugui, which are both IDP camps uh, located in Borno State, Nigeria. So during testing, we collected some good practices. For example, uh, we saw that the men liked the audios they felt they could easily relate to the message and could understand it very well. The level of Hausa was, was okay for them. They didn't have any issues with the translation. The podcasts were easily well understood by the adults. The children, however, understood the illustrations because they could picture the concepts we are addressing. The illustrations made also their attention easily focused throughout the sessions. We also got some lessons learned, for instance, uh, although Hausa is a general spoken language in the Northeast Nigeria, it is not the mother tongue for men in Borno. Hence, the adults have a better understanding of the audios than, uh, than the children, given their interaction with uh, many other people. And as such, many other Hausa speaking people. And as such, one recommendation would be to explore the option of uh, translating the podcast in Kaluri, as it is the most widely spoken language in Borno State. Also, it is recommended that the facilitators working with this product should make reference to the child protection uh, glossary shared by the child protection subsector for Northeast Nigeria to simplify any difficult word. Yeah, another recommendation would be to create animation videos for facilitators to support in building their capacities and also to facilitate the dissemination of quality messaging at community level. And for me as a practitioner, these illustrations and the translation of the podcast in Hausa makes my work very easy because it makes facilitation easier. Thanks for this opportunity to share and thank you for your attention. I remain available for any questions. I would like to give the floor back to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for presenting that. Um, Delight will be putting up a link to uh, the illustration package. So if you haven't seen the Lake Chad illustrations of the CPMS, um, you'll be able to, to get them off the Alliance site, I think, by next week. I think it's really interesting, I mean, the whole, the whole initiative, but I, I wanted to point to, obviously, the use of local language, the use of podcasts, so not just presentations or illustrations or trainings, but actually trying to have things that are in smaller clips, especially things that can be done at a distance, given the COVID-19 situation. And also the use of the summary. As I said, it might be a better entry point for many of the people that we're working with that don't want to delve into the whole 28 standards or don't even want to go into one standard in a lot of depth, but would like to have the understanding of the minimum standards as a whole. So thank you so much to the plan team and, and to Lisa in particular for, for bringing us that. Uh, the next presentation is by Save the Children. We have Peggy Inyang. She is the CPIE coordinator for the Cameroon Refugee Response in Cross River and Benue states in Nigeria. Benue, I think it is, in Nigeria. Before joining uh, Save the Children, she worked as a community engagement and public-private partnership advisor on the USAID LOPIN 3 project where among other achievements, she collaborated with communities, NGOs, public and private sector partners to ensure that vulnerable children, and especially those in conflict-affected communities, received support ranging from access to health, education, child protection, livelihood. So she's really well-placed to help us look at how we can be looking at integration of child protection programming with other sectors by using the minimum standards. So Peggy, over to you. So this is Peggy from Nigeria. So I would, um, I have very bad internet connectivity here. I hope this sails through. So um, we have this conflict in Cameroon that has seen over 50,000 persons coming to Nigeria for refuge. So we have um, refugees and we have returnees, among whom over 50% of the population are women and children. So um, most of the child protection concerns 
that we see are um, unaccompanied separated children, children who are in need of psychosocial support, children who are abused, and children who are given away in child marriage. So as part of our rollout for the CPMS in this um, region, we have been training frontline volunteers on WASH, even on education, but let me concentrate on education for now. So we've done a lot of training and we have tried to integrate the CPMS minimum standards for WASH into the work that um, we do. So some of the indicators um, we have tried to work with to accomplish the child protection objectives in WASH, provision of safe and secure WASH services and facilities and um, ensuring that our WASH activities are disaggregated by sex. So we also have um, our WASH volunteers who know where to refer children whom they identified in the course of their daily activities to for um, child protection, for child safeguarding and sexual expo exploitation and abuse concerns. Okay, so these are specific activities that we try to conduct with the WASH colleagues to ensure that their activities are sensitive to the child protection minimum standards, are um, consideration of the CPMS during the assessment, during design, during implementation and monitoring of all WASH um, activities. So that's a little bit easy for SAVE because SAVE is actually the um, WASH partner on this particular project. So we also work with community groups to ensure that um, parents and caregivers do not put children at risk during um, collection of water and other WASH related activities. So this takes us to working with communities, strengthening community-based mechanisms to protect children. So for this particular response, we have what we call the beneficiary reference group, whose primary um, objective is to ensure that WASH activities are not just safe for the entire population, but that WASH activities are also safe for children and that they who represent their communities know where they can go to, to report concerns um, of child protection and child safeguarding. So for the provision of support to children, we try to ensure that the support we provide to children um, are gender sensitive in terms of what boys get and in terms of what girls also get. So for the volunteers, um, I think all categories of volunteers have been trained, skilled volunteers and skilled volunteers, those who are on casual hire, and vendors who provide services to the WASH project. So they've all received training on child protection, they've all received training on child safeguarding, and they are aware of the minimum standards that we expect in the delivery of their services. So um, that's integration of child protection into WASH. So we want to look at integration of child protection into education. So the basic rollout here has been almost the same as that of WASH and it's been mostly training of SCI project staff, the formal and non-formal learning center facilitators on child protection, on child safeguarding, and on some of the minimum standards that um, we were able to contextualize to the work that we do here. So some of the indicators from the CPMS that we um, are working with are as shown on the screen. So we have basically the formal and non-formal learning environments that are considered safe for children. So for this one, we have um, done assessments for on schools, formal learning centers and non-formal learning centers. Most of them are public um, schools because we are trying to work with the CRRF, the Comprehensive Refugee Framework, where we domicile our activities in existing government systems and structures so that the refugees naturally integrate into systems that are already in place. So we also work with um, teachers and then we also work with learning centers to monitor if the spaces continue to be safe for children to um, participate in uh, learning activities and also to identify the risks that could um, come up in the course of children accessing the centers. So we also look at the barriers to enrollment, the barriers to retention in school. So mostly um, in this situation, we realize that the barriers to enrollment are mostly poor or lack of livelihood by caregivers 
And the same thing has to do with um, retention. For the girl child, we observed that um, retention was also linked to the availability of hygiene. Thank you. We're starting to lose you. So um, basically, some of the practices that we consider to have been good um, on education are ensuring that we work with um, the communities and in particular that we work with children from assessment through um, implementation and during monitoring. So the meal team, we work with um, the meal team to ensure that indicators that have been captured at the design of the project are monitored for and that the voices of children are also um, heard during the entire program cycle for education. So as part of our activities in the education sector also, we try to do um, trainings and trainings for teachers, including um, that of conduct. We try to see how we can integrate the Save the Children's Child Safeguarding Policy and its PSEA policy into the work that um, the teachers are doing in the school. So where possible, because they represent Save the Children, we also try to see if um, they can sign onto our child's um, save, our safeguarding policies. And where this doesn't um, happen, we continue to strengthen the school system so that they can have um, policies and regulations in place that also protect children. So um, for education, going ahead, we would see that um, there's a little bit of constraints in education and achieving the objective of, of the CPMS, especially within the um, CRRF. So the CRRF um, would have it that children um, attend schools that are within the host communities, usually government schools for sustainability and also to improve the capacities of these schools. So sometimes you could have a situation where um, a settlement is not located too close to the school. So children of um, school age so um, I, I was talking about the CRRF, the Comprehensive Refugee Framework, and um, working within. Okay, so working within the CRRF in terms of education. So sometimes it becomes. I'm afraid now we have lost Peggy. I think uh, because of her connection issues and the time, we may have to close her presentation there. So we'll have to wrap that presentation, but I think it was, uh, Peggy was giving us a number of good examples of how they've been using the minimum standards to really drive the integration of education and child protection work with, you know, design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. I'm sorry that there was some of that connectivity uh, challenges at the end. Are there any questions? We've asked for questions in the chat box and I don't see any. So you should see now a question about what other support would you like on the 2019 CPMS? You can answer as many as you like. For example, would you like uh, standard specific webinars, other kinds of webinars, case studies around the CPMS implementation, videos on the CPMS generally or a specific uh, standard? podcasts, uh, and I should mention the launch of the Alliance's new podcast series called Protected. So if you go onto the Alliance website, you'll be able to hear the first one, which is about uh, MHPSS. Face-to-face uh, -face training, when that becomes possible, online training on specific standards, uh, support to adapt the CPMS or contextualize it locally, and support to actually do a launch in your country or in your context. So I see one person is answering, two people are answering. Please, uh, if you can let us know. Um, what you think uh, would be most interesting, most helpful, then uh, we'll try and follow up with that over the coming, coming days and weeks. Uh, I'll quickly pass the floor to Jan to say uh, a closing remarks from UNICEF's perspective, and, and then we'll move to close it overall. Jan, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the panelists, uh, and thanks for staying for uh, with us uh, for the for the full webinar. I think we've uh, we've seen very interesting example of uh, what does uh, those standards means for all of us. Again, I think uh, we need to find a balance between uh, getting, and I think that was the example of Niger finding a, the right balance in getting a, in a in a long term contextualization process. 
the need for us to better use those uh, standard you know, response package. We'll be happy to uh, receive or support uh, in countries any, uh, any initiative on the contextualization. We've been discussing with the Alliance the way to get those manual uh, to you. So let's hope uh, we find uh, the, the, the right way and that uh, you all have a copy in the, in the coming months. And again, I'm just uh, using this opportunity to remind that as you all know, UNICEF is uh, in charge of, is supporting the coordination uh, of child protection. And it's really essential that uh, we all come to consolidate our data, consolidate our strategy, consolidate our approach, because this is the only way for us to position all of us to position the sector as one of the key uh, uh, response uh, strategy in a humanitarian uh, setting. As uh, Joanna uh, was saying, protection is uh, the, the centrality of protection is now a knowledge, but sometimes, and I'm sure you've got the same problem, uh, it's hard to see the, the financial uh, engagement of donors uh, on that specific sector. So let's work together and please do share experience uh, via the National Child Protection Working Group. So that, uh, like that, we can uh, also uh, share it globally, but also share it with uh, other countries in the region. Over. Thanks. Wonderful, Jan. I don't think I could have put it better. So we absolutely support all of you at the national level and at the regional level in your efforts, you know, from us at the Global Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group and the Alliance overall. We are here to listen and to support you. So if there are more resources or guidance that you need or more tools, perhaps, uh, and we're sharing the poll results here of what those tools might be in terms of online training or more standard specific webinars seem to be um, the things that you are requesting the most. So we will try and unpack that with our regional colleagues over the coming weeks. Jan had mentioned the handbooks. The English handbooks are available through um, the global mechanism. So it's possible to ask uh, the global CPOR or, or Adama to distribute them to areas where there are coordination groups in effect. And UNHCR headquarters also has a stockpile. So if you're in a refugee context, you could request the English headbooks by those route. But we are also really encouraging you to go digital if possible. And in that push, we also have the videos, of course, that we want to be sharing with you. We have the pre-existing CPMS video series. We have This is Samira, or uh, then we have Hannah's New Job, which is about the CPMS in particular from the child protection workers' point of view. And then uh, towards the end of June, we'll be having a new introduction to the CPMS to share with you as well. So please do look out for those resources uh, you have here on the screen, the website where you can go, as well as the contact details for Adama's help desk. And with that, we hope that we will be in touch some more. Again, a big thank you for staying with us to the end of the webinar, and also a big thank you to the panelists for taking time today, which for so many of you was a holiday. With much appreciation, we'll sign off and wish you very well. Bye for now.